day everyone! For today's episode, we will be talking about human person as an image of God. The book of Genesis chapter 9 verse 6 states that whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. In our previous lesson, we learned that the statement God made man in his own image does not literally mean that we are created out of the same and exact appearance of God. What does it really mean? The phrase image of God is a theological term which applied uniquely to humans. In other words, man is the image of God. The phrase image of God basically denotes the symbolic relation between God and humanity. The term has its roots in Genesis 1.27, which says that God created man in his own image, just like what is written in Genesis 9.6. Again, this scriptural passage does not mean that God is in human form, but rather, humans are in the image of God, in terms of their moral, spiritual, and intellectual nature. Therefore, humans mirror God's divinity in their ability to actualize the unique qualities with which they have been endowed and which make them different than all other creatures. That is why humans are called rational animals. Many great philosophers share their statements regarding their belief in the existence of God. Does God really exist? Let us read the statement of St. Augustine to the existence of God. God as an absolute thou. When we say thou, it means you. Therefore, we can read it as God as an absolute you. The word absolute is a synonym of unconditioned or unlimited and the opposite of it is relative or limited. To mean absolute, the existence of God must be unconditioned. His existence is not obtained from any being outside of himself. Unlike in the case of man, his existence is relative whereby his existence comes from someone of greater power. By experience, everything in this world is limited. Man lives and soon dies. But God is not part of this world. Therefore, God is not limited. He is absolute. When we say God is absolute, it means that no one and nothing goes beyond Him. He is the highest being, the supreme being, and everything that we can and cannot see is not and will never be higher than Him. That's why His existence is something that we cannot question. Unlike in the case of man, Man's existence is relative or limited because man lives in this world, and everything that is in here is limited. People die, we experience food shortage, water scarcity, even nature has its limits. Why? Because it is in this limited world. Therefore, man's existence comes from someone of greater power, and that is God. Because God is not limited. He is absolute. Another statement from St. Augustine is man as an image of God. If God is not a part of this world, then there must be something that will serve as an image of God to represent Him in this world. If we can possibly find his image in this world, then, therefore, that image must also be limited because everything in this world is limited. What image could that be or who could that be? His creation. Man. Not all things in this world are created and not all the things are made. Creation is producing something out of nothing, while to make is producing something out of something. Man cannot create because of his limited power to produce. Thus, he needs something to produce another thing. 
The power to create is God's business because of His absolute and unlimited power. Now, the question is, how did God create us? Here's the thing. We must always remember that create is different from make. Creation is producing something out of nothing, while making is producing something out of something. God created this world out of nothing, and that is what we call the power to create. How did God do that? He was able to do it because He is absolute and His power is unlimited. On the other hand, man cannot create because of his limited power to produce. Therefore, he needs something to produce another thing. And that means that the power to create only belongs to God. I will be discussing St. Thomas Aquinas and his five arguments. But first, for those who don't know yet St. Thomas Aquinas, he was the greatest of the scholastic philosopher. And his first argument is the argument from motion. St. Thomas Aquinas concluded from a common observation that an object in motion is in motion by some other objects or force. From this, he believed ultimately that there must have been an unmoved mover who is our God who put first thing in motion. So it simply means sa kapag hindi ka naniniwala na nag si God, ito yung argument niya from motion that when we say motion, of course, an object is in motion. Kung isang bagay ay gumagalaw, it simply means na may nagpagalaw. For example, pagpasok mo sa room, nakita mo yung table. Maniniwala ka ba na ang table na yan hindi pumunta mag-isa doon? Kung naniniwala ka sa maliit na bagay na yun, kahit hindi mo nakita kung sino, pero laka na may nag-move ng table. Asan yung paniniwala mo na nag exist si God? Kung naniniwala ka sa absolute power, therefore, sino ang nagpamove kay God? Di ba wala? Dahil tinatawag siyang unmoved mover who first put thing in motion. The second argument of St. Thomas Aquinas is the causation of existence. Aquinas concluded that a common sense observation tells that no object creates itself. He believed that ultimately, there must have been an uncaused cause who began the chain of existence for all things. Walang isang bagay ang makakakreate sa kanya dahil may pinagmulan ang lahat ng bagay. At yung pinagmulan na iyon ay wala nang kasunod kasi siya na yung pinaka-uncaused. At siya na ang pinaka-pinagmulan ng lahat kasi si God is the one who began the chain of existence for all things. It's like the argument from motion, the only difference is that lahat ng bagay ay gumagalaw. So it means may unmoved mover na dahilan ng paggalaw. At doon sa simula ng paggalaw na iyon, siya na ang pinakauna. Ganon din dito, that the cause of all existence for all things, yun ay uncaused. Uncaused of God dahil si God ang unmoved mover. The third argument is the contingent and necessary objects. Aquinas believed that we have two objects in this universe, the contingent being and the necessary being. This contingent being cannot exist without the necessary being, causing its existence. Aquinas believed that the existence of the contingent beings would ultimately necessitate all of the contingent beings to exist. This being called a necessary being is called God. So in short, in order for the contingent being to exist, we need the necessary thing you see in this world like humans, animals, plants, and etc. And the necessary being is called God. He is necessary because He is the one who created everything in this world. The fourth argument is the argument for degrees and perfection. Aquinas formulated this way from a very interesting observation about the qualities of things. This is referred to as degrees or gradation of equality. From this, he concluded that for any given quality, there must be a perfect standard by which all such qualities are measured. In this argument, Aquinas believed that everyone has its own standard. We have different definition of perfection. But one thing that we sure about is there is one perfection being, and that is the Creator, our God. The last argument of St. Thomas Aquinas is the argument from Intelligent Designer. 
Aquinas stated that the common sense tells us that the universe works in such a way that one can conclude that it was designed by an intelligent designer, God. In other words, all physical laws and the order of nature and life were designed and ordered by God, the intelligent designer. This argument best describes the beauty in everything that our God created. It explained that our Creator is an intelligent designer because He created everything in this world equally. All the imperfection we have in this world is ordered by our intelligent designer, which is our God. So next, let's talk about the philosopher's concept of man as an image of God. First is Socrates. According to him, the end of life is to be like God and the soul following God will be like him. So it means, ang pagkatapos ng buhay ng isang tao ay parang si Jesus. Hindi pa talaga yon ang katapusan ng lahat. Dahil may panibagong yugtog pa tayo ng buhay katulad niya. At kung sino man ang naniniwala sa kanya, ay magiging katulad ng kung anong katangian na mayroon siya. Then the second one is Plato. According to Plato, a human being is the toy of God so we must live playing. So it means, si God ang creator natin, parang tayo yung nagsisilbing laruan niya. Siya yung kailangan nating sundin and it's our responsibility to serve and follow His rules dahil kung wala siya, wala din tayo dito sa mundo kung nasaan tayo. Then the third one is Aristotle. And according to Aristotle, the man who is content to live alone is either a beast or a god. So may kasabihan nga tayo na no man is an island. Walang sino man ang kayang mabuhay mag-isa o kakayanin ang lahat ng siya lang. Kaya nga sinabi ni Aristotle na kung sino man ang kayang mag-isa, it's either he or she is a beast or a god. Beast dahil alimaw o para lang siyang hayop o ganid na kayang makontento sa ganong sitwasyon. While si God naman, dahil si God, dahil si God lang ang may kaya ng lahat, kaya nga siya ang ating creator. Then the fourth one is Friedrich. And according to him, which is it? Is man one of God's blunders or is God one of man's blunders? So this means that God is being fair in everyone. However, gusto niyang ites ang ating faith or paniniwala sa Kanya kaya dumadating tayo sa point ng life natin na nahihirapan tayo to choose between happiness and kung ano yung tama. But in the end of everything, He will never forget His promises. The fifth one is Jacques Maritain. He is a French philosopher and he said that the philosopher says that God's knowledge is the measure of thing and that thing is the measure of man's knowledge. Gaya nga nang sabi ni Jacques Maritain that God knows everything. He knows what is right and wrong. But man's knowledge is different because every person have different opinions and experience. The sixth philosopher is Johnny Erickson Tada. He is American evangelist and he said that your heart, mind, and feet are stamped with the imprint of the Creator. Little wonder that the devil wants you to be ashamed of your body. Gaya nga nasabi ni Johnny Erickson that our Creator, every little thing on us, he is the one who created us, so we must love and accept it. But because devil is bad, he wants us to feel ashamed. But we must not follow devil because he will just destroy us. The seventh is Susie Kasem. She is an American philosopher and, he's, and she said that if all men are in God's... If all men are made in God's reflection, then why do some people continue to accept only what is in their part of the mirror? If every man was created equal and in the image of God, then how can any man claim that one race is better than another? When Susie Cousin said this because Bible said that man created in the image of God, but in reality, some people is thinking the outside appearance. Because it only means that man are like God because of the qualified of human nature which allow God to manifest in humans. 
we also must stop comparing because we are all created by God. The last one is David Dokusen. He is an American evangelist and he said that, As image bearers of the same Father, each one of us reflects a different aspect of beauty of God. When we separate ourselves from others who are different from us, we cannot see the fullness of the beauty of God. Yes, we are all created by God, but we are still people. We have different lives and experiences that we have. So we also have different aspects of beauty of God. We have different qualities. We are still people that really don't know everything. Just don't hesitate yourself from what are you want to do. We still made mistakes, but that's okay as long as you've learned from it. We heartily welcome your views, queries, and applause. That's it for today's video. See you next time. Bye!